Hello, everyone. Welcome to Words Apart, Words Together, and where best friends share laughter stories and an unbreakable bond. And today we have a very special guest with us. His name is Kyle Stolk, and he'll tell more about himself for you as well. But he is um, a retired swimmer, a retired Olympic swimmer. And since everybody knows who has listened to us for a while, that Leah and I both kind of started this blog and podcast as like, what do we do with our lives after we don't train for 20 plus hours anymore a week for a sport? Um, so we kind of decided that we wanted to talk to someone who's experienced something similar, but then on a different level. So here's Kyle, everyone. And Kyle, who are you? <laughs> Hi, good uh, evening, morning. Um, I'm from the Netherlands. You guys are in America, or at least one of you. Um, who am I? Um, Kyle Stoke, 27 years old, South African born and raised until I was 11. Moved to Ireland, lived there for three and a half years, and then end of 2010, moved to the Netherlands, pretty much to follow up a swimming career. Um, yeah, started swimming when I was six. Kept going until I was 25, I think it was, and now mm-hmm. retired since, yeah, I'd say May 2021 was my last competition, officially, and then took a little while to kind of like take some distance from the swim sport, and then fully retired in December 2021, very cliche mm-hmm. of 31st of December. New year, new me. No longer professional. No longer professional athlete. Did the cliches, and now living life to the fullest. Uh, traveling, meeting new people, doing fun stuff, and like being on this podcast. Of, exactly, <laughs> with worlds apart, worlds together, unbreakable bonds. Oh. <laughs> Start talking about the molecular structure of water. And again, that H2O in here, it's an unbreakable bond. And they start adding hydrogen and stop blowing stuff up. But yeah, so a little bit more about me. I like uh, long walks on the beach. I do actually like long walks on the beach. But no, in any, any weather or? I'm definitely not the Dutch weather. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> I mean, like it's, it's 10 degrees outside now, but it was like minus 10 last week. Uh, no, I'm a very busy guy. I like to keep busy, do different stuff, do new stuff, go to new places, meet new people, try new things, live by the model of um, don't knock it until you try it. Uh, I believe very much in life in that piece of Ubuntu, uh, South African Zulu phrase, which means I am because we are, so that everybody that you meet along your way, that you can learn something from and that they can also learn from you. So it's cool. Hopefully tonight I can learn something from you guys. And hopefully we can learn something from you and our listeners as well. I hope so. So my question for you is to start. um, Well, you said you started swimming when you were about six. Why swimming? Well, we lived in South Africa and we lived just outside of Durban in a place called Mantum Todi. Um, And also in Johannesburg where I was born, we had a swimming pool in our garden. Um, and my parents thought it was very important for my brother and I to both be water safe at a young age. Um, yeah, even in the Netherlands, well, South Africa, you had many problems every year of children drowning mm-hmm. at their home swimming pool. Um, so my mom, she was a swim teacher also. So they kind of put the two together. It's like, OK, start teaching them swimming at a very young age. Um, I was as a six year old, very competitive very boisterous, very energetic. Um, I would come home from school and I would like get undressed and go skinny dipping in a swimming pool straight away. <laughs> and then my parents were at a certain point kind of like, okay, like swimming, you can't sit still, put them together. And they were like, hey, do you want to go swim a competition? And that's pretty much how it started. And from there, it went really well for the first few years. Um, made from like six to eight, made like a lot of like school teams and went to like school championships within South Africa. Um, when I was about 10, I started like falling out of love with the sports. 
um, yeah, kind of like started making friends and was doing other stuff and mm. kind of like fell out of it for about half a year. But then we moved to Ireland. I had a really good connection with the coach there, Dave Malone. Uh, he was a paraplegic uh, Olympic champion from Ireland on the backstroke and in Dublin started training with him. And he kind of like fired up this talent that was within me. Um, from there, it was pretty much full throttle, only swimming, and went in about a year from like winning like a bronze medal on the 200 meter butterfly at the Irish Championships because number one got disqualified. Um, so a year later, winning like eight golds, and yeah, got into this like little age group of very interesting international competitions on European level. Uh, but that couldn't be for Ireland. South Africa is not European. And through my dad, I've always had Dutch nationality. So we contacted at the beginning of 2010, the Dutch Swim Federation, flew out for a few competitions, went back and forth. And then end of 2010, decided like, okay, let's full on follow that swimming dream, swimming career. Always had a passion for swimming. I remember very, very well when I was eight was when the Athens Olympics were on in 2004 and that's where South Africa won the four times 100 meter freestyle gold with the men and that was my big inspiration so it's always very weird that a lot of the Dutch swimmers are like oh it's Peter van der Hoek Bonjour <laughs> ideal role model and they're kind of like nah I had Greg Niedling, Roland Schumann, Lyndon Ferns, Darian Townsend and like those top four um but yeah that's kind of like my story to how I got swimming my mom still says that I could swim before I could walk. Okay. Then I'm Very sure nice. It's, uh, it's one of those motherly things. <laughs> um, so you spoke a little bit about how um, you like traveled from South Africa to Ireland and it ended up in the Dutch team. And so that was through like your dad's connections. Was he Dutch? Yeah. So he was born in the Netherlands and he moved to South Africa when he was 15 um my mom is originally from south africa um the connection from south africa to ireland was that south africa is a very dangerous place um a lot of things happened there my parents didn't really see a good future for my brother and i um so they were looking to move somewhere else my aunt on my dad's side she married an irishman moved to dublin a long time ago and when my parents were on the fence of where did they want to move to they got into contact with her and they never wanted to force my brother and I to learn a new language. We were English raised. Um, coming to the Netherlands, you pretty much, it is very handy to learn Dutch when you're living in the Netherlands. Like you can get by without it, but if you come here and you're seven or 10, kind of like it is one of those things that you're expected to do. And they wanted to make the transition as easy as possible for us. So we had family in Ireland, English speaking. So that kind of like put the two together. Um, yeah, and then, as I said, kind of like my talent started growing there. And at a certain point, I was very much like, oh, I'd really want to try and make something of being a professional athlete. Um, we had contact with the Dutch Swimming Federation. And the great thing in the Netherlands was that, especially in Eindhoven, you had your, I don't know what you call it, America, you probably call it high school, secondary school. Um, that was based around swimming. So we called them a low school. The St. Jordas. Yeah. Um, so I was 14. And when you tell a 14 year old, kind of like, oh, you get to go and swim all day and go to school whenever you want, I was like, <laughs> sold. Um, so that made the deal a lot sweeter. So I really wanted to move to the Netherlands um, to follow that swimming career. And I was 14. So my parents were like, okay, sure, let's go. And that brought us to the Netherlands. So is. Did you... oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Did your brother swim as well? No, no, he's uh, we're polar opposites. I'm the more, I'm the sporty, the more extrovert, the more traveled one. He's the creative painter, book writer, uh, stay at home introvert, got a small little place, and he's good like that. So he kind of just like moves along with the flow of all yeah, the. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it wasn't like from South Africa to Ireland was for us quite easy. Um, like we knew like we were leaving friends behind and that was horrible and yeah. it did hurt. But we kind of like we were so young and it was this like, oh, you're going to Europe type of thing. 
Um, so that went quite well. I really wanted to move to the Netherlands, but he didn't. Like, he absolutely didn't want to move to the Netherlands. So that kind of, like, also pushed him back in his growth. Uh, so it took him a while to kind of get out of that. Um, but, yeah, at a certain point, he also started doing his own thing. He realized in 2017, when he was done with his high school, that he wanted to go back to an English-speaking country. So he, together with my parents, because they also wanted to, like, stick around with him. I was old enough, they think. I was 21. <laughs> um, but in 2017, my parents then moved with my brother to then England okay. so that he could follow his college or university school there in a much easier fashion. Um, cool. I was at quite a young age, quite mature. Um, I was at that point in a pretty serious relationship. A lot of swimmers in the Netherlands at a young age move out of their houses quite young. Um, so for me, it was kind of like, okay, I'll, I'm just going to stick around in the Netherlands while they go to England. And England isn't that far, so it's it's a no quick no, trip if also, you need. Yeah, so they lived in Brighton, which was an hour down south from London. And pretty much going from door to door, you could be there within six hours. Yeah. So from Eindhoven, you'd fly for an hour to London and grab a train for another hour down south. Um, so it was quite doable. You could even drive it, drove it a few times with a channel or with a boat or with a train. Yeah. Um, what was crappy in that period is yeah covid hit in 2020 yeah. and that kind of like locked the borders and yeah. yeah that made it a little bit harder and like you know you're not that far away because it's a proper sea border you can't just like sneak across the border and see each other yeah. or anything that's like that. that's how it is that's how it was with my family australia completely closed their borders yeah um so like even though i was a citizen it was jumping through Every yeah. you could think of to get over there. I am. Oh, so you're Australian. I'm American. Then at nine and a half, my whole family moved to Australia. And then I came back for swimming in the U.S. Oh, and okay. I stayed for grad school. So I've, I've yeah, been from one side of the world to the other and then back. <laughs> okay, so we're all very international here. So you've got like me going from Africa, Ireland. You're, it's Netherlands. You going America, Australia, America. Yeah, and you've got Marth going Netherlands, America, Netherlands, America, Netherlands. Ah. So you're the least traveled dude. Come on. <laughs> well, I've been to different countries. I just haven't lived there. <laughs> I'm, 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 fair I'm, enough. I'm, fair I'm, enough. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, Romeoville, Illinois is pretty, pretty <laughs> exotic. Oh, yes. <laughs> so is St. Charles. I've been to a lot of places, but this is well. This is nearly number one on my bucket list. <laughs> sure <laughs> nearly it's not number one but it's nearly it's in the top um, five it's in the top five what can we say <laughs> depends on which five you're counting so the the move that you made to the netherlands to start school is that the time that you say this is when i became a professional athlete or did that happen at a different time Mm, I think it's very much when you define being a professional athlete is when you start earning from the sport that you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, with me, that only really started happening in 2014. Okay. Uh, that's when I started getting government funding. Before that, I had a few like sponsor deals. So I got all swimsuits or goggles or a little bonus here and there, some prize money. Um, I do think, however, that the goal to become a professional swimmer really did start when we moved to the Netherlands. So mm -hmm. pretty much when that happened, it was, yeah, you were training with the national team, you were working towards big international competitions, you were um, comparing yourself against European standard, world standard, um, mm -hmm. especially in Eindhoven, you've got the inner sport log, uh, so you're very much like working into the details of swimming. It was no longer, oh, we're just going to go and swim 10 times a week and do a couple of blanks. It became a proper, like, okay, we're going to break it down into bits. We're going to work step by step. We're going to work with goals, plannings. Uh, it became very serious very quickly. So in that sense, the move to the Netherlands was pretty much the one of, okay, like, now we're going to try and make something of it. Yeah. Um, but actual, like, earning and making a living from swimming 
sadly in the Netherlands, it's not the best <laughs> sport to earn a lot with. No, I don't know uh, if it's anywhere, really. <laughs> no, unless you're the Michael Phelps, Kate Ledecky with sponsor deals yeah. and Caleb Dressels or anything like that. Um, in the Netherlands, it's pretty much, you're going to swim, you're going to have a great time, you can win medals, break records, but once that swimming career stops at, for me it was at 25, for others it's maybe 32, 35, you're still going to need a job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, I had a great professional career, looking back. That's good. And so I guess you kind of already answered this question of like how many years you competed with professionally. You said we're probably starting in like 14 through 2022, so about eight-ish yeah. years. So I'd say about like, oh, so my very first, so my first international European competition for like, at a serious standard, like in an, uh, in Ireland, I did a few of these like Ireland against Wales, Scotland, England competition, and then I swam for Ireland. Um, but that was more from a school delegate than from a like nationality delegate. Um, okay. the first from national standard was then in two thousand and eleven at the okay. European Youth Olympic Festival in Trabzon in Turkey. That would have been like the first international competition. Last international being competition being the world championships in Guangzhou in 2019 um and then first senior competition was in 2015 so I'd say pretty much from the senior standpoint probably from 2015 so about 2021 that was then like the, the professional standard of being like right an athlete in an adult world earning money <laughs> so that's six years yeah. And so you said last world championships in like 2019, but during the intro, you said that you didn't really quit swimming until 2021. Um, yeah. Why did you decide to stop? Well, so 2019, summer 2019 were the world championships in South Korea. Then in I think in December 2019, you had a European, you had a short course championships, mm-hmm. either world or European, I can't remember. Um, I don't remember qualifying for that team. It could have been that we also chose not to go to that competition to focus on Olympic qualifying. That mm-hmm. happens sometimes in the Netherlands. Don't really remember that. And then come 2020, that's when COVID hit. Um, we got put into lockdown. Um, everything got pushed back. Um then it was very much okay training again through 2020 mm-hmm. um 2021 there was the european championships and i qualified for that european team so to speak um only in the preparation to that competition my results were getting so bad that i was just i lost this confidence in actually going to these european championships so we had our qualifying champ- competition in Eindhoven in April and they went really badly and the European Championships were in May and I asked my coach together with then the technical director at the time we were like okay I want to do a time trial before we go to these European Championships mm-hmm. uh, to just check that my level is good that I can go there with confidence right. uh, European Championships being the last qualifying meet for the Olympic Games of Tokyo 2020 plus one <laughs> um so i remember it very very well that on the tuesday i taped down um had the time trial on the tuesday evening uh it went terribly so i swam down got my gear and that was pretty much kind of like okay no i'm not gonna go to your european championships and just go and just compete and just finish 18th miss a semi-final or just get through to a semi-final um i always had this mentality of oh no i'm competing because i want to be the best um Mm -hmm. as far as that was it's kind of like okay i'm not going to compete just to be number two i'm not going to compete to just make a final or to just make a semi-finals and it might sound very arrogant but i've been to european championships before um so you really wanted to make that next step instead of just going and just competing and it's like it's an amazing competition um, but I didn't want to just go there and just take part. Um, so when the time trial went badly, I was kind of like, yeah, no, I'm 
I'm not going to go there. And in the Netherlands, you say it very well for specabona <laughs> or beans and bacon. You're not going to go there for beans and bacon. And I was kind of like, no, nah, this just isn't what I'm doing it for. So I packed my bag, uh, went on holiday for a week. And that was pretty much the last time that I was competitively in a swimming pool. So that's kind of like also due to COVID. Um, yeah. Kind of like everything just got pushed back a year. Mm -hmm. um, 2019 was for me also like with family and mentally a very difficult year. I was already like losing that enjoyment in the swim sport. Uh, I was pretty much just motivating myself, like just keep going for a year. So if you get 20, you're nearly there. You're not going to get like, you're not going to quit. You're not going to give up with a year to go to the Olympics. Yeah. And then everything got pushed back. So I kind of like just added on an extra year of trying to keep yourself motivated, trying to like tell yourself that you're going to make it working through the, like the demons in your head for another year. That just made it like a lot harder. And then in the end, just the results just kept getting worse and worse. Um, the contact with the Federation, with the coach, with the technical director, it was just, it was all downhill. Mm -hmm. Um, and at a certain point, it was just done. So that's fair. Just yeah. kind of your fire and just died down a little bit, maybe. Oh, completely. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, it was very much, I was pretty much running on fumes at a certain point. I was just like, okay. Um, that's one of the like the perks of what happened with COVID is that so when COVID, just before COVID hit, I was technically jobless. So I was like, I didn't get any funding anymore. I had three months of like 70% funding that I had to like find a job and prove that I could go back into the working field. Uh, but when COVID hit, the government was like, okay, we need to support our athletes. So we're going to give them funding again. So I got funding for an extra year. So that was kind of like also my motivation to just keep going. It's kind of like uh, I'm not getting paid again. Everything is closed. I can't travel anywhere. Um, I was studying at the best time of my life because like, when COVID wasn't there, I was missing everything and couldn't follow anything while studying. And now, now all the lessons were online. So I could go home and just be like the regular student while still swimming. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a bit of a weird situation, but the fire was pretty much burnt out, running on fumes and just, just surviving pretty much. Yeah. I think that actually is quite a common theme especially the people who were kind of like retiring or kind of just like on the border like at least in the U.S. for like collegiate swimming because everyone got given a fifth year yeah. and most people were like oh yeah I'm gonna take it and then they the mental part of it hit hits them so much harder than they expect it to yeah. And because they're like, oh, four years, I'm out, I'm done, whatever. But then they kind of get hit of, wow, this is so much harder to kind of like yeah. readjust. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what also made it harder for me, like personally, and this is definitely not the way people should be doing it, is I was already, already imagining a life after competing at the Olympics uh, what I was going to do then, where I was going to go on a holiday. Like, I was planning with my, back in 2019 already, um, went on holiday to Bali. And even after that, I was already planning, kind of like, okay, so the Olympics will be next year in August or July. Say August uh, from September, I'll just, like, stop studying. Um, I'll go together with my girlfriend. We'll travel for half a year, take some break from the swimming. Oh, where are we going to go? And we were pretty much, we were planning this whole, like, South east asian trip um end of 2019 so i was really much like already i was busy with my life after the olympics yeah. which motivation wise also doesn't help when you're still supposed to be competing at the olympics at that top level yeah um and then with everything just being pushed back just made it a lot worse that makes sense yeah yeah it is one of those things that kind of like when you're a top athlete, you kind of think, oh, you can focus completely on your sport mm -hmm. while still thinking about like, oh, what are you going to do after that? Whereas I realize now pretty much one, if you're a top athlete, you just got to like fully focus on that, live in the moment, just be right. there. And then when, when it's happening, 
instead of living in the future, even if that future is sport wise, but also the other thing. Wise. Yeah. Which I do kind of think when we bring it back to like, okay, how's life after retiring? Um, for me, it wasn't that bad of a jump. Like, because I was so busy with my life after okay. swimming, I didn't really have this whole black hole that I fell into. Yeah. Um, I knew after, like, I stopped swimming and I pretty much, within a week, I made a plan of, like, how I was going to finish my degree. Um, so I was thinking about, like, okay, when am I going to go travel? Like, really wanted to travel for that half a year. Um, what other things do I want to do? New hobbies. Um, like, I was very much busy with life after swimming whereas I didn't feel like oh what am I going to do now I think that might also be a big difference between my situation and maybe like your guys situation as you guys went from a college swimmer yeah where your swimming is also based around your college and then you finish swimming but you also finish college at the same time Mm -hmm. um so that's kind of like double up where because I was doing my degree on such a slow pace like I started in 2017 with my first year but I did my first year of degree in two years I did my second year and third year over three years I also traveled for half a year came back I've been like puzzling everything around so I'm still busy with my degree while I've even been working for a year and a half um but that made it a lot easier to have something to focus on instead of going from Four years, full on degree, amazing team, to nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we kind of went from... Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. Okay. My phone, my phone went red for a second. No, I mean, fine. for... I think for me, because I... Everyone here talks about, like, identity crisis of athletes. Um, like, I, like, try to prepare myself. Like, I'm not going to have this crisis. But it does hit you, even if it's not, oh, like... Yeah necessarily as hard as you know someone who is more professional and that's been their whole day every day for several years I I have classes I had internships I had jobs and I was still swimming but because it just took up such a huge chunk I was like dang yeah. like what is that next step yeah yeah and for me that was very much like okay so I stopped with like 28 hours of physical activity in a week um because I also left the sporting world in quite of like in a down spot like I wasn't enjoying it I wasn't enjoying the people I wasn't enjoying the coaches um I really just didn't want to have anything to do with being an athlete anymore so I went to the gym spent a few hours there but I also met up with friends went out partying um started planning in trips uh I dived very deeply into my studies um watched a lot of tv played a lot of playstation (laughs) um but yeah started like doing other small things what is it you're studying by the way i'm studying to be a primary school teacher so mr kyle teacher kyle um (laughs) in the netherlands that's anywhere from ages between four and 12 years old um and then it's all subjects so it is just primary school kind of like the basics so a little bit of math a little bit of history some geography um sciences physical education english music dance a little bit of everything and then at the moment i've quit working so i worked for a year and a half well a year with half a year of traveling in between as a substitute teacher Mm -hmm. so for any teachers that were pregnant or sick or in the netherlands we have a a massive shortage of teachers um so a lot of schools just don't have enough staff to keep the children there so i would come into the school for a month or three or four um work for a couple of days and then after those couple of months go to a new school that was mostly just for me to be able to fill my backpack with a lot of experience Mm -hmm. only last christmas i quit said okay i'm gonna focus solely on my thesis at the moment Mm -hmm. which is what i'm doing now and then come March, I'm going to start working four days at a school here in Geldrop, where I live in the Netherlands. Okay. And then I'm going to be working, it should be that I'm going to be working with the youngest age group. So oh. the four and five-year-olds. Oh. And, uh, it's adorable. It's like I'm going to be spending the whole day, I'm just going to be 
<laughs> singing songs, going to be talking about colors. We're going to be playing with clay and cutting stuff and playing outside. And I think I'm going to put in a nap time. And <laughs> no, You'll be taking the nap with them. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's my nap. It's not their nap. <laughs> <laughs> my nap time. But no, no, I'll be signed there in March. But for the so, moment now. Sorry. Thesis. No, go for it. What well, what's your thesis on? Uh I'm doing about resilience. Oh. So something that's also very dear to me. I've got a tattoo of it on my shoulder, like the word resilience. Um and what I'm researching is how the teachers create an environment where they consciously teach children resilience. Oh, um interesting. So the school says, okay, we teach children to be resilient but what does that mean like what does resilience actually mean and do all the teachers within school have the same definition okay and how do they control and monitor a child that comes in when they're four is growing resilience wise to when they leave the school at 12 years old so, so is that the, a lot of survey based information like collect data collection or interviews? Yeah. yeah, so uh I've done three different ways. I've done interviews, I've done observations, and I've got a survey going out. Okay. And I've pretty much been doing that the past yeah, I've now got five days a week to work on it. So I've been doing that for the past uh two weeks. It's been busy with then observations, surveys, and all of that. And I'm hoping to be done halfway through February. Nice. That's cool. Yeah. I think this is a good time to take a small break um, because our yeah. time for the meeting is also running. So then we'll hop on the new meeting and we'll continue our conversation. Yeah. Just leave. All right. So we left off at kind of like a transition point of basically moving on past swimming so I guess, um, what would you consider <clears throat> some of your biggest or your, whether there's multiple little ones or just one big one, um, challenges after quitting swimming and retiring? Ooh, challenges. Okay. Um, I think one of the biggest ones for me was then the body image going from this Okay, I was, even when I was, like, super ripped, three and a half percent body fat, I was still kind of like, no, nah, it's not good enough. So I was like, yeah, when it comes to a male standard of body image, also not in a very good headspace when I stopped the swimming sport. Mm -hmm. uh, but then to go from this professional athlete that trained 28 hours a week, uh, you were could eat anything pretty much because you knew you would train it off, but you were also watching what you're eating, um, the timing, the amount of protein, everything like that. Uh, that was a big change. It's kind of like come to grips of being an average person with average eating habits and not having to be the full-on eight-pack, ripped shoulders, uh, that sort of thing. So that took a while to get, kind of get used to. Um, the freedom um which sounds in a positive sense but kind of like swimming was very structured yeah. um maybe we could set in that way kind of the, the structure of the swim sport suddenly i had a lot of freedom i had a lot of time to do whatever i want i could go to bed at 3 a.m wake up at 8 and not feel guilty that i've lost 0 0.01 second of my dream of being Olympic champion, which is kind of like the mentality that I had here in the Netherlands. Mentality that is also kind of like pushed upon is that if you do one thing wrong, you're ruining this huge goal. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you would wake up Monday to Saturday at 7 a.m. Uh, you would be in bed by 11 and suddenly you've got 30, 35 extra hours in a week to do whatever you want so that took some adjustments um for me it was also a big adjustment realizing that the people you meet during swimming are colleagues not friends or family um i grew up very much believing kind of like oh no these people are like family we're here together we see each other so often like ride or die and then you walk out of swimming pool and pretty much from 90 percent, you hear nothing from again maybe yeah. now and again but 
yeah, you kind of like you lose those contacts. So that took a lot of with it, with the not necessarily feeling alone. Like I had a lot of people around me, but kind of the confusion of like, oh, these people that meant so much to me, I thought, and I meant so much to them, um, completely changed. Um, yeah. What I notice now that I'm still kind of like working on, even after nearly three years of being out of the swimming scene, is having this like ultimate goal to work towards. It's like this big dream that is so shiny and so amazing. It's kind of like do everything to get there. Um, and that's what I'm kind of like missing sort of what I'm coming to grips with in my life now is that I don't have that. Yeah. Um, pretty much anything that I want to achieve, I can either work for it so I can buy it um, <laughs> or just like work towards it. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of like, it's not at this age that I think, oh, I'm not going to go be a Formula One driver and become the world champion. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like I've realized now I'm at the age where anything which you start now, you're going to be terrible at. That's also <laughs> something I find difficult. Is any any hobby I start now, it's kind of like, it's pretty much not worth it because within two weeks, I'm kind of like, no, nah, I suck at it. I'm, I'm <laughs> not going to do it anymore. And then you've really got to motivate yourself to get better. Um, I do do it. It's got to be there. Like, I do try um so yeah very much that higher goal that you work towards yeah that that i miss now uh it took me a while to come to grips with the perfectionism of being a top athlete um pretty much working at one degree differences with your start working towards 0.01 finish uh breathing one times less than a whole hundred meters um kind of that very perfect mentality perfect lifestyle perfect body everything had to be perfect and then coming into the regular world where sometimes good is good enough um yeah. that took some getting used to that was kind of like one of my big lessons when also going into my studying is that i didn't need to get like an a plus i was happy with a b i was happy with a pass kind of like in the netherlands you work on a grade from one to ten and five and a half is a pass um and the 10 is like the best which you could get like i didn't need to get that nine like a six seven good enough then you spend a couple of i'm hours. still working on that one i'm still working on that one it's like if yeah. it's not top marks i'm i get very frustrated <laughs> yeah yeah and the problem i had at a certain point was also it's either it's got to be top marks or i just don't give a shit and we're not going to look at it anymore <laughs> um, there's no in between there's, there's no in between. nothing there's, in between <laughs> no nah, there's no gray areas here it's either it's good it's bad that's kind of like yeah um i think those were the difficulties what i did very find difficult was then the jealousy of stopping of mm -hmm. seeing these other swimmers uh, people that you are very close with, friends of yours, um, perform well. Um, they're just kind of like, oh, why them and not me type of idea. Yeah. Um, that was very kind of like, yeah, but I put in the hours. I was there 20, yeah. 28 hours a week. I was doing my best. I was following everything the coach was saying. I was like living life to a T, kind of like working your ass off to get there and kind of like, why did they achieve and I don't? Yeah. Um, I feel so like, kind of like, sorry to interrupt, but no, go for it. I feel like it is like that regardless what level of sport you play. Because yeah, it's, it's, I, it's human nature to compare. With, within college sports, um, I've even had friends come up to me and be like, but they're going partying and I'm in bed by nine o'clock every night, but they're still beating me. It's yeah. Like, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> like, it's it's hard. Yeah. yeah, it's just one of those things that's kind of, it's very human nature to compare. Yeah. And to kind of like, yeah, feel then sorry for yourself or feel that life's unfair or, yeah, very much why them and not me. Yeah. Um, so that's something I really had to come to, yeah, come to be okay with. Um, yeah, because then it is kind of like, I stopped in 
May, and then you see all these people going to the Olympics. Yeah. And then I would think back and be like, yeah, but if I swam this time that I swam in April 2019, like two and a half years ago, I would have made a semi final, or I would have been on the relay team, or I went pretty much in a year and a half time going from like the Netherlands fastest 100 freestyler at the time um, to being number six. Kind of like, yeah, well, where's the karma and that? Where, how is that fair? Right. Um, yeah, and then seeing these people, the, the like the men's 4 by 100 freestyle relay team compete at the Olympics, you're kind of like, shit. I should have been. I wanted to be there. I should have been there. Yeah. And it's always shoulda, coulda, woulda. And then it becomes very much like this whole mental challenge in your head, kind of like this whole sumo wrestling game of the jealousy, but also kind of like you want them to perform well. Yeah. Because they're like, still your friends and you... You're still your friends. You've come, you've like spent hours with them. They know some of your deepest secrets. Um, but then again, you're kind of like, yeah but no i want to be there so yeah it was very much like the, I, I have no idea that i want them to win that i want them to lose that i want them to like miss me and be like oh if kyle was there then you <laughs> could have won a medal and then your head start playing games on you and starts making stuff up and yeah it's that, that was a challenge also to get through yeah um so kind of hearing what you say about all these things that challenged you um, I'm sure in your how many years of swimming there are certain things that have turned you into you hard into you in god damn English in, Mark. <laughs> brain fart um, they turned you into who you are today and what do yeah. you think are the main things that shaped you for who you are today I think pretty much everything that I've mentioned has also shaped me. Like part of who I am is also that perfectionist is mm -hmm. the um, looking for the best way to do something. Um, but do you think that was already in you from a young age or did that really come starting like whenever you started competing at a higher level? I don't know. I find it a difficult question. It very much comes down to the basic of what is nature, what is nurture. Mm -hmm. um I think very much like because I was at a young age competing very well like I was way above my age group um I was a, a an eight-year-old training with 10-year-olds when I moved to the to Ireland I was 12 but I was already training with uh 15 16 17 18 year olds yeah. so that helped me to mature very quickly gave me muscles gave me like a body that wouldn't have been there probably without swimming yeah um swimming taught me how to shave my legs hey <laughs> i'm a heterosexual male and i know how to shave my legs kind of like <laughs> only swimmers know how to do that yeah um but no it told me a lot about planning time management setting goals um working towards this higher goal um dealing with the situation as it is as horrible as it is as a swimmer and it is very much whoever wins the 100 freestyle at the olympic games was the best on that day at that time might not be the best swimmer ever might not be the best swimmer in that swimming pool um there's m multiple accounts of swimmers who a month before swam a world record and then at the Olympic Games, come second, come fourth, don't even make a final, get disqualified. Um, yeah. So it very much, it does teach you to just take it as it is. Um, yeah, brings you a lot of dedication. Uh, I think there are very few people that can dedicate their life, their time, their energy to something so, so well yeah um i mean i think we've all lived and breathed swimming uh it's and that's the annoying thing with swimming it's not a weekend sport or you go and do it three times a week and no. the rest of the time you're just gonna go and have fun it is every day 
every day, multiple times day in, a day. day out. Um, like watching it, your food, like your sleep. Yeah, yeah. It's twenty four seven, and that's kind of what also pushed me away from the sport. Is it? It was twenty four seven, and then from the coaches, it became three hundred sixty five. It was no weekend there was no oh you're gonna go on holiday to Bali for three weeks go have fun come back and we'll work it off it was hey trying to see if you can find a swimming pool every second day try and get some gym sessions make sure you're doing a dry land watch what you eat it was just I, I would be on vacation holiday and would still be focused on swimming there was no downtime yeah um it taught me a lot of culture I met a lot of people, shared a lot of stories, saw some amazing countries, um, taught me a lot of respect um, for myself, for fellow athletes, for officials, um, just for a sporting world, how to actually communicate with people. Mm-hmm. Um, taught me very well how to deal with feedback, yeah. how to be critical, and actually how to have somebody come to me and say, hey, you're doing this wrong, maybe you can do it better by doing it this way and not get into a hissy fit and be upset and sulk for the next day, yeah. but just be like, hey, thanks for the feedback. No, you might be right. I'm going to give it a try. Yeah. Um, told me a lot about food that even three years afterwards, I still know, okay, it's not good to eat a packet of chocolate every day. No. Um, Damn no, it. every second, every second day is okay. Okay, is, good, good. Then I'm <laughs> right on dietary, schedule. <laughs> dietary advice here. No, we joke, we joke, we joke, joke. <laughs> but no, I've met so many people along the way that taught you so many lessons. That I don't know. I think it is very much a lot is nature. Um, I think I have to look at my nature side. I'm still throughout the swimming career, even before that, this colorful, extravagant um sometimes over the top extrovert doing introvert needing um character Mm -hmm. that loves adventure loves trying new things and exploring uh having conversations that that was all there before swimming i think a lot of the what we say in the teaching world um i don't even know the english word the executive functions so time management, planning, um, emotions, kind of like those basics. Yeah, you learn that so well with a sport. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be swimming, but I think if I'm ever lucky enough to have children and they can find a passion in a sport like swimming or anything else, it teaches children so much character that I just, wish my children or anybody yeah. else's children also to just follow that path and it doesn't have to be at olympic level i mean no i mean i can level, a junior level um, yeah i think i can speak for both of us that swimming has given us a lot of characteristics that otherwise may not have developed as much yeah and ultimately it's also taught me how to swim i think that's one that's very like <laughs> under underestimated is i know so many people now that say that they can't swim or that yeah. they'll go to a swimming pool and they'll swim for an hour and be completely dead completely tired and i'm kind of here going like how do you not know how to swim right and like how, how have you missed this like <laughs> most important part of your childhood is to just know how to swim the freestyle yeah. How are you going to sort of and, fall out of a boat? Yeah. Or the amount <laughs> of people that you've got to explain, kind of like, what is butterfly, backstroke, breaststroke, and freestyle? Yeah. <laughs> and then you start telling them, it's like, oh, and you've also got the medley. And they're like, what's that? And you're like, yeah, you do all four strokes. And they're like, at the same time? And you're like, no, <laughs> in a row. <laughs> no stopping. Um, yeah. It's kind of like, it's just, uh, I mean, pretty much hey, the planet is heating up and it's all going to flood over water and swimmers will survive. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> the world That's what will what just be swimmers. That's oh, kind of yeah. terrifying. That's, 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 <laughs> that is. That's very scary. <laughs> I think that's also the great thing is that swimmers are a certain type of people. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it is very stereotypical, but it would not be good if we were all swimmers. No. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> 
So looking back kind of um, where you are now versus where you were then, do you think it yeah. would have helped um, you transition or just helped you mentally or with any of those challenges to talk to a retired athlete or anyone that was kind of like guide you or help you cope with these challenges? Yeah. Yeah. I think it would have always helped to have somebody to be that mirror. Um, somebody that has gone through the experience, somebody who has firsthand recollection of how it is. Um, I'm in a situation at the moment where you pretty much realize in life that nobody knows what they're doing and we're all just doing our best and we're all just trying to get by, but we can help each other immensely. Mm-hmm. And especially going from that dark hole of not knowing what do I do after I've done this professional sport to just have somebody on the other side that says, Hey, you can see the light at the tunnel. It's there. We'll get through it. Um, this is what I did. Maybe this helps. Um, not even, not even to just give advice to just kind of just be there just to listen. Yeah. I think that would have also helped a lot. I mean, even when I stopped swimming, I had this whole idea of life in front of me and I was very excited to go and get new tattoos and go and party and go and try new stuff and go and travel. Uh, but there were still sleepless nights. There were still moments of crying and emotion of this whole world that you've left behind, this whole identity. Um, yeah. Because that, that was what it was at a certain point. For me, it was my identity. I walked into a school and people were like, oh, Kion. They were like, oh, the swimmer. I was like, yeah, that's me. And pretty much the teachers knew me as the swimmer. Yeah. Um, I identified as the swimmer. Um, like my past, like in the year of leading up to, like during COVID, I was in conversation with, uh, with multiple psychologists and with like a mental coach, just trying to disassociate myself from the athlete to just being a person just being Kyle to figuring out of who you are without swimming and I think a lot of people don't even experience that they kind of like end their careers as that identity as an athlete or as a swimmer and there's so much more to everybody than just that and I think to have somebody to listen to to talk to to guide you through would help immensely That's good. I feel like Leah and I, we kind of <laughs> talk to each yeah. other <laughs> as yeah. we, as we, because we kind of both went through it at the same time. Um, yeah. We both took our fifth year, but then I went to Lewis University and Leah stayed at Lindenwood. So we swam for different teams, but we kind of had the same schedule. But your, mm-hmm. Leah's conference was one week later, I think, than mine. So my career had kind of was a week longer. Oh, yeah, but I had to do last chance meet because my coach wanted me to swim again. So we kind of did end at the same time, but we were just both like, "Well, it's done. (laughs) What now?" Yeah. Yeah. To be fair, though, I had mentally checked out like a solid year and a half before because. I got seven years of college swimming and not the four and then the five. I actually had seven years. So I kept taking them. And if I'm realistic with myself, my, I peaked probably what my second year at Lindenwood. So it was probably my real junior year. And then Mm -hmm. I kind of, I guess it was my real senior year. I kind of made myself swim two more years and A lot of my college career through those seven years, I swam and trained by myself, wrote my own sets, <sighs> did my own yeah. gym because of NCAA rules and regulations. And I had to transfer schools and all this yeah. red tape. But, and so I would watch my teammates practice and I'm yeah. like, I have my own lane and I'm doing all this on my own time and my for respect. respect. <laughs> it, it, it was hard. So to a lot of yeah. extent. Up into my last year, my last year, I kind of started disassociating from swimming and mm-hmm. focusing on like work or school or whatever it is. Um, but it's still because I was like in my mindset, I was like, I already know that 
you know, it's going to hit me hard because for 18 years, that's what it's been day in and day out yeah. for me. And a lot of it's been on my own and I've forced yeah. myself to do it and all that kind of stuff. And I was prepared for when this happens and all this. And I've read a bunch about, you know, just, you know, identity and athletes, like mm -hmm. losing their identity and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to be prepared. And then I finally retired. And even though it was a year that I really should have been done anyway, it still <laughs> hit me so much harder than I thought. And I told Mart, I'm like, yeah, this is going to be a bad year coming yeah. up. Yeah. 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 Because even if you're mentally ready to be done, you're still pushing yourself to those 20 plus hours a week and day in, day out, waking up early, going to bed, hopefully early. Um, but yeah. then all of a sudden, all that practice and all those rules and routine, like you said, just yeah. fades away. Yeah. yeah. No, they don't fade thing. away. It just full stops. <laughs> yeah. Because that yeah, is I don't thing. Know. I, yeah. Sorry, do you guys do any, any training period of like down chaining of like building it down? Like I pretty much went no. cold turkey. Yeah. Same. Oh yeah. Same. We do. It was I after conference. Up, literally yeah. hang it up. And I never went back. I went back once. Like three months later, I think I swam like twice in one week and I was like, I need some more time and I haven't gone back. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think that's also it. You just need time. Mm -hmm. It's it's time. I think for me, what the hardest part was is that that routine just was gone because yeah. I'm very much a routine kind yes. of person. And the last few months at Lewis University, I barely had any class. So I was just literally waiting for the days yeah. to pass by. And I was feeling so miserable. Like there were days where I would wake up after 10 hours of sleep. And then I ate breakfast with Michael. And then I came back to the room and I took a three hour nap. Yeah, and Got that enough. was like that for two weeks after swimming, just because yeah. one, I was so tired and two, I didn't have anything else to do. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it was a very, yeah. very rough time for me. <laughs> and how do you come out of it? Like, is it still a rough time? Are you still working through it? Uh, do you feel it's, it's like, do you guys feel better. like you put? Now that I have more of a routine, like I wake up almost every morning at seven o'clock, go to school and then just do my days. Um, so I have found more of a routine, but I'm not, really settled into one place yet because I travel so much between home and school. Um, so I feel like once I'm really into one place and I go to work or do whatever from that yeah. place, I feel like I can really build that routine again. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very much, if you want that routine, like you, you want the routine, I want to leave the Netherlands as soon as possible. <laughs> oh, no, not that way, but okay. Very much. Bye. So like, <laughs> what to do and where to go but i'm gonna work up until the summer and then take it from there and i don't know i traveled for half a year and didn't have any routine and just lived like the life of just Been wake dream. up what you want to do go surfing go swimming go hiking yeah uh, go to the next destination i thought well, that's so fun that's i like, wish like, i could do that felt. but i have no money to do that <laughs> <laughs> Don't need money to travel. That's a thing. I Work mean, away, honestly, I need a little bit. Couch surfers. You need enough to kind of like get going. But yeah. Once, once you're there, yeah, you'll make do. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't any, don't anybody stop you from your dreams. Go for it. <laughs> like this is the way we go motivating. <laughs> you only live once, you know. Exactly. Yeah. You believe in that. Some people believe you live multiple times, so you never That's know. True. I hope not. <laughs> Mart doesn't want to do it. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> oh, you can do it in a different form. You can be like, you're good to come back as like. I like cat. to be cat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll be a house cat. My cat um, has the best life ever. So. Since we only have 10 more minutes, time has yeah. flown. I think I want to ask you one more thing. And. Okay. That is kind of what is some advice that you would like to pass on to others, either professional athletes, college athletes, just people who are kind of in the same spot as you have been where they they're done with their sport and they kind of are like, what am I supposed to do now? 
Um, I think for me, it was very important to find the balance at a certain point of being a professional athlete, but also having your downtime. Um, I kind of got into a disassociation of thinking, okay, I need to be an athlete 24 seven, where that's not necessarily true. Um, some people work very well at being an athlete in the swimming pool and being a party animal at night and can still become Olympic champions. Um, find what works for you, find that balance. Um, but really something that I would have really enjoyed to have experimented with, or at least tried before quitting my swimming career was heading more into the holistic approach of lifestyle of breath work, mindfulness, meditation, um, the power of your own body and own, like the Wim Hof, like having cold showers, mm -hmm. um, working on your immune system, um, approaching the body at a different perspective than what is necessarily known as. Um, that would have been amazing. Um, talk to people. I think that's also one of the biggest things that I've learned in the years is talk to people, let them know what you're thinking, ask them what they're thinking, talk more to your coach. And especially what would have helped me is to take more agitation of my own process. Um, okay. Just the fact that you also say, okay, my coach wanted me to swim this race kind of pretty much already says at a certain point I was doing it for other people. Yeah, I was following somebody else's schedule I was living life on automatic pilot the routine was no longer it was a routine but it was a zombie routine I woke up I went to the swimming pool I found the session that the coach wrote for me I did the gym session another coach wrote for me I went home and ate the meal that the dietitian wrote for me I uh, went back to the pool and did another session that the coach wrote for me went home and slept because that's what the doctor told me um yes so, okay. yeah think for yourself talk to the people around you find the balance try out of the box experiments and have fun i think that's the thing kind of like i lost fun in the swim sport um as an eight-year-old i had this massive passion and this dream and this goal to someday make something of myself um and i did, did. you did Looking back, i have this amazing career of a world record olympic games world championships european championships i won medals i won individual medals um i've got such a amazing cabinet of medals and all my medals sit in a box in my downstairs basements like i don't have a single medal on display and it's not because it hurts but it's just because it's at the end of the day it's not that medal which actually meant something to me it was the experience it was the the moment yeah um but at that moment it was a lot of pressure mm -hmm. it was a lot of negativity it was a lot of okay you've won european gold but in a two months time there's olympics so put it away and we're going to carry on yeah um so have fun enjoy it live in the moment and just soak it all up because once it's done it's all just memories and metals in a basement or in a cabinet gathering dust and yeah i think that'll be it okay well that was very beautifully said <laughs> And that was a good note to end on, I think. Yes. So um, thank you, Kyle, for joining us today on this blog and sharing a little bit of your story. Um, and thank you for our listeners for joining us as we offer a glimpse into the world of true friendship, where even though worlds may seem apart, the connection remains strong. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I kind of feel that also if... If there are swimmers out there or other athletes that have more questions, just hit me up. I'm like, yeah. I'm not a scary guy. I like talking to people. So, what's yeah. the best place to uh, find you on social media or whatever? 
probably Instagram. Just Kyle mm-hmm. underscore Stolk. And we'll uh, put your information yeah. down in the in the notes for sure. And then our one listener that we have can <laughs> religious real listener. Yeah. Hi mom. <laughs> yeah, so well. Pretty but much. thank you so much. And it was very nice talking to you. And thank you for taking the time to meet with us today. Of course. Thank, thank you for having me. Goodbye. <laughs>